Greetings and welcome back to 303 in Junior English. We now turn in our hymnals to page 921 and an introduction to the Harlem Renaissance poet uh, Conti Cullen. Uh, let's begin with dates, 1903 to 1946. Uh, we're going to be looking at a set of lines from the Dark Tower. Uh, let's read together. Unlike most other poets of his day, Conti Cullen used traditional forms and methods. Yet no other poet expressed the sentiment of African Americans during the early 1900s more eloquently than did Cullen. Cullen was born in, Louis, uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, raised by foster parents in New York. As a high school student, Cullen's gift for poetry was recognized when he won a citywide competition for his poem, I Have a Rendezvous with Life. An outstanding student, he also worked on his high school newspaper and literary magazine. During his undergraduate career at New York University, Cullen's poetry was published in the, e. uh, the W.E.B. Du Bois uh, magazine, The Crisis. Cullen later earned a master's degree in English and French from Harvard University. His first collection of poetry, Color, was published in 1925. That volume was followed by Copper Sun, 1927, The Ballad of the Brown Girl, 1927, and The Black Christ, 1929. In 1932, he published One Way to Heaven, a satirical novel. In his later years, Cullen published two children's books, The Lost Zoo, 1940, My Lives and How I Lost Them, in 1942. Let's now turn specifically to the poem that we will be studying from The Dark Tower. In this poem, we're going to point out that the speaker is defiantly going to assert that his people will not always work so that others can profit. He then will embrace the comforts of the night and find support in flowers that can only grow in the dark. And he says that his people will hide their pain while they wait. Uh, there's a couple of important things we want to point out here. The first is the background information. Read it with me on 926. Conti Cullen dedicated this poem to Charles S. Johnson, an African-American sociologist, editor, and author of a landmark study of race relations in the 1920s. The other thing we want to point out is just look at the number of lines here really quickly and identify we got 14 lines, which tells you that this is a sonnet, okay? We'll also see some end rhyme as well as part of this. All right, let's go ahead now. We'll just listen to the uh, poem read, read along, and let's go to work with it to try and see how well we do here in terms of just prepping for, um, for the poem. From the Dark Tower by County Cullen to Charles S. Johnson. We shall not always plant while others reap the golden increment of bursting fruit, not always countenance, abject and mute, that lesser men should hold their brothers cheap. Not everlastingly while others sleep shall we beguile their limbs with mellow flute, not always bend to some more subtle brute, who are not made eternally to weep. The night, whose sable breast relieves the stark white stars, is no less lovely being dark. And there are buds that cannot bloom at all in light, but crumble, piteous, and fall. So in the dark we hide the heart that bleeds, and wait, and tend our agonizing seeds. Now let's pause for a moment and point out that the poem, while a sonnet of 14 lines, notice is divided up. Did you see this? So we have two stanzas actually to this poem. So we have to ask what's going on in stanza one, what's going on in stanza two. Let's pay attention now at level one to just what exactly is going down here as, a, as we uh, understand the poem from a level one read, summarizing what it is that we're reading. Notice first of all, there's the pronoun we, right? That is to say, this is a poet who is a speaker who is going to speak for a large number, and of course here we're talking uh, obviously about those who are black uh, people, especially black Americans who have been poorly treated for a very long time. And the poem is going to suggest something has got to give. Let's take a look. We obviously at 3A are going to reference Langston Hughes's poem, I Too, aren't we, uh, when we think about a, a text like this. Notice, we shall not always plant while others reap the golden increment of bursting fruit. In other words, we're not always going to be the ones doing the planting so other people can get the fruit of the planting. Notice the tone here already is somewhat defiant, if not hopeful. 
not always countenance, that is to say our look, right, our, our, uh, our, prove, our, our tolerate, our approval of, of the face, right? We shall not always countenance abject and mute that lesser men should hold their brothers cheap. Notice the use of the word lesser men. That is to say individuals who are actually not as good as they appear to be who are always using us. Let's just put it at level one this way. We're not going to be used forever. We're not going to allow ourselves to be used forever. He says at line five, not everlastingly while others sleep shall we beguile their limbs with mellow flute. In other words, while others sleep, we play the music so that they can sleep well. We think about maybe slave culture where the owners are going to treat badly the slaves. And he says, it's not always going to be this way. Not always bend to some more subtle brute. We were not made eternally to weep. So this is compelling first stanza. He says, we have done this thing of working so that other people can gain the benefit. By the way, do notice that we're back to the planting theme, so we can jot down at 3A. Obviously, the poem that we just worked with, the Bontrebs poem, of, uh, on, the, on the previous page, A Black Man Talks of Reaping, right? He says, we were not made eternally to weep. There has to be a moment when we stop weeping. The second stanza at level one for us is of obviously far more hopeful. The knight whose sable breast relieves the stark white stars is no less lovely being dark. In other words, just because the knight is black does not mean that the knight is not beautiful. And there are buds, plants, that cannot bloom at all in light but crumble piteous and fall. There are some flowers that can only bloom at night, so in the dark we hide the heart that bleeds and wait and tend our agonizing seeds. Whoa. Now the final lines here, we could jump to 3A really quickly, will remind us of the final stanza of Longfellow's Psalm of Life. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. We have the same kind of sentiment going on here. In other words, in the second stanza, the observation is, we will not tolerate this for much longer because we were not made eternally to, to weep, to cry. But we are going to embrace the fact that we are not only black, but we are beautiful in the same way that the night can be black and beautiful. And we will hide the heart that bleeds and wait and tend our agonizing seeds. There will come a day, the poet speaker says, when we will be able to move beyond this really terrible situation that we are in. Of course, it's significant, and we can point this out at 3A, that one of the most important civil rights songs sung a lot, you've probably seen it in movies or on video, is the, are the words, we shall overcome. In other words, we're going to get beyond this, we're going to get past this. The poem ending then with some sense of pride and hope. All right, let's jump to 2A really quickly with major messages and themes. Obviously, we have several here. One is, we will not take this for much longer. We are not going to continue to be used. We will not continue to be poorly treated. We were not made eternally to weep. So it is a critique, a criticism of the past. Another second message. It is a message of hope. There is reason for us, the poet says, to be hopeful, to be proud of the very fact that we are dark, that we are black. If the night is black and can be beautiful, so can we. And finally, number three. We have to wait, but we will wait and tend our agonizing seeds of hope, our dreams. There will be a future that is better than our current present, which is built upon a prejudiced past. Of course, let's turn now to 2B, the rhetorical observations we've already pointed out. Notice this is a sonnet. We have 
the iambic pentameter. Notice we have our um, rhyme scheme as well. Reap, cheap, fruit, mute, A, B, B, A, right? Notice the rhyme scheme. Sleep, flute, brute, weep. So we've got a continuation, a, a, a very conscious decision here uh, on the part of Conti Cullen to write a sonnet. Notice as well that at 2B we've got the powerful symbol of reaping, of sowing and reaping. And the idea is here that we are not going to just do this for the rest of our lives, for other people. Also, you have the powerful image of the night as being beautiful. It's a beautiful image. It's a beautiful image. The night is black, but it is beautiful. Therefore, we can also think of ourselves as beautiful in spite of the fact that our skin is black and the white, often, culture has tried to make us feel inferior because of our skin color. Let's jump to 3A really quickly. How does this poem relate to other titles? First of all, just stick with the other two titles that have come before. We've already mentioned A Black Man Talks of Reaping, and then think about Claude McKay's The Tropics in New York. Notice in all three of these poems, there is a sense of longing, a sense for something to be different, a sense for a hopeful change that someday will come, possibly in the future. There's also a sense of going back in time and kind of critiquing and looking at the past, critiquing the past. What is for you your favorite song about fighting? What is your favorite song about don't give up? What is your favorite song about make sure that you always keep stay true to your dreams? Do you have a song? Do you have a movie? Do you have a favorite video? Maybe a video game that you've played where the underlying message is, whatever happens, don't quit. Whatever happens, keep going, keep working, keep working, keep working. Finally, at 3B, the way that you personally can relate to this kind of a text. What is for you a time in your life you felt used? What is a time in your life when you felt like, you know what, I'm doing all the work, somebody else gets to get all the rewards and the benefits, and it's not fair, it's not right. Do you have a time in your life when you stood up to somebody and said, you know what, I'm not going to be poorly treated by you anymore. I'm not going to allow it. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to defend myself or I'm going to defend a group of, of, of people and say it isn't fair, it isn't right. Finally, how do you respond when people try and make you feel lesser? How do you respond when people try and make you feel like there's something wrong with you? Especially for something that you cannot change like your skin color or your socioeconomic situation. How do you feel if somebody makes fun of you? How do you respond to that? What is the best way to wait and to tend your agonizing seed, your hopes, your dreams? What are your major dreams that keep you going? Another 3B question. Well, there you go. Conti Collins from The Dark Tower. Thank you.